I'm going to continue and take one step forward today um, in this message series that will be called Redeeming Rainbow. We're going to talk about the idea of sex today. Now, Apple, you know, has a new icon, a new emoji where a man can get pregnant. Who would have thought in the 21st century we can fly people to, you know, moon and, and to the stuff and believe in weird, bizarre things that men can get pregnant. Recently, one of the side kick, sidekicks or side, um, sidekicks of Mr. Beast, who has a, probably one of the most subscribed subscribers on YouTube, over 140 million um, subscribers. And the reason why I'm highlighting that is because his sidekick, you know, Chris Tyson, who, you know, came out and publicly started to defend different form of sexuality. He was married, has a two-year-old son, and went from being a father to, you know, acting like a, like a woman and transgender in uh, embracing a different identity. And a lot of people, your kids, uh, watch uh, Mr. Beast because he makes a lot of pretty funny videos. And somewhere behind the scenes, I do see the enemy is trying to fill um, this hidden encrypted message to our children through the emojis, through the videos that, hey, it's okay. Uh, it's normal. What your parents are saying is outdated. The world is evolving. Your God is oppressive. He is uh, harsh. Uh, there's a different version of God that you can experience where he's more loving tolerant, has rainbow colors, and he embraces every form of sexuality, even those that are not socially accepted, or at least were not socially accepted. Something is shifting in our culture, as we already know, and there is a sexual revelation that produced, I believe, sexual revolution in our culture. 1960s sexual revolution broke out in America. Make love, not war. Um, free sex. Embrace your passions. Don't try to suppress your desires. You know, don't clean your closet. Come out of the closet. You know, live your life loud and proud. And around that time, there was a, a person who I believe single-handedly, single-handedly um, affected the moral spectrum or the sexuality of our culture. And this guy, he was a zoologist in Indiana University, Alfred Kinsey. He's called the father of sexual revolution. He redefined sexuality for us in America especially in school education, our legislation, as well as a lot of things that are happening around the world. What he did is through his two books, it's called the Kinsey Report. It's today being used in universities. It's used as the basis for legislation to change our laws. And it's used as the basis to change the world view on sexuality in America, what is called Kinsey Reports. He wrote two books. One is called about human sexuality of males and the other one is human sexuality of females. It was, they were written in about 1950s. In those books, two books, what he did is he brought taboo topics and shocked statistics about how the things we think are not accepted are actually practiced behind the scenes and the America should change its laws to adapt to its norms that we are afraid to admit we have. For example, one of the things is he said, 17% of farm boys have physical relationship with animals. He said that over 70% of women have an affair and not only it doesn't affect their marriage, it actually helps their marriage. He said 10% of males are practicing homosexuals. He said that in 1950. Right now, Gallup um, report is saying that currently 2023, only 5.6% of population in the United States are practicing homosexuals, 5.6%. So the fraction of our population that are openly living LGBTQ community lifestyle is not 10%, it's only 5.6%. So this man fabricated, exaggerated reports 
to show to the American audience that the things we are afraid of are actually happening behind the scenes. There's these norms we should adapt to that are really sexual sins and sexual perversions. A few things that I will highlight. One of them is he told us to change our laws to fit the facts. But his, his facts were off. Alfred Kinsey team researched the most deviant sexual behavior in America and passed it off as normal. He said that these behaviors are biological normal. They don't hurt anybody and they should be morally acceptable. People should act on their impulses with no inhibition or guilt. The challenge is this, is most of the people that he interviewed, they said about 17,000 people he interviewed for his report. Most of them were people who were locked up in jail as sex offenders and pedophiles. In fact, one of his books used experienced experts or trained pedophiles, nine of them, to tell us information about sexuality of children and he got that information from pedophiles. They should have locked him up to, in jail for that. But his research affected so much of the culture that one guy was inspired by his research and actually started a Playboy magazine. His research was quoted in courts his findings were quoted in front of the school boards to change sex education for our children when in reality it not only it was flawed but he took the worst of the worst of the society and studied how messed up and screwed up they were in their sexuality and said this is how the whole society is. It's kind of like taking a serial killer, studying his impulses, his lusts and passions and say, we all should lighten up on our laws on murder because all of us inside are just a bunch of serial killers. That's exactly what happened. Some of you say, well Vlad, whatever he did was weird, bizarre, it doesn't matter. But I'm going to share, share a, uh, a study that was done. In 1951, a study at the University of California, psychology students were split into three groups. One group studied Kinsey's research for nine weeks as a form of education and two other groups studied normal teachings on sexual education and other stuff. After nine weeks they did a sex quiz on three groups and this is what they found out. Students who learned about Kinsey's work were seven times more open to premarital sex and twice as accepting of adultery. Number of students open to same-sex experience went from 0 to 15 percent. They were less swayed by religion or parents' rules about sex. What does that tell us? The rise of millennials wanting to identify and identifying as part of the LGBTQ community. If you look at the statistics today compared to my parents' generation, my generation and the generation after me, the rise of the homosexuality, you may say, where did it came from? You have to understand one thing. When you teach people particular things, something happens. It opens them up to particular experiences. The Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. If truth sets us free, lies bind us. When you begin to teach a culture for a long time that you came from animals, we begin to behave like animals. And then we begin to throw away the sexual restraints, we begin to throw away the Judeo-Christian views on sexuality and we let children who are very susceptible be, be filled with lies about their sexuality. For example, sex education in the United States for children, elementary, middle school and high school was mainly focused on basic biology and basic reason of why sex exists and how procreation happens and the importance of knowing about sexually transmitted diseases. That's what it was. Today it's different. Today it's about promoting other forms of sexuality and tapping into everybody's dirtiest thoughts and impulses and say that is not dirty. That's okay. You're not the only one. Everybody has them and you should explore it and if your mommy and your daddy tells you that is wrong they're oppressive 
and they are bigoted and they are trying to control who you are. What we have instead is we have camps and safe houses provided by tax dollars in a Washington state where you can run away into and the doctors can perform surgeries that will be in line with your most devious thoughts. Instead of changing your thoughts, we can remove perfectly working body organs. That is what's happening in our culture and the man who helped to fashion that in 1950s was Alfred Kinsey. The worst part about him isn't the only thing that he used pedophiles and sexually immoral people as a form for his study. Is that he believed and taught that children from birth have orgasms and pedophilia and incest benefits children. This is one of the reasons why the target is on children today in our schools that you should trust your little child whatever they feel shouldn't be taught you should just trust those feelings and those desires and foster them even if they go against the social norm against biology and if they go against the teachings of the scripture he went so far into that in fact in his book, 1948, Sexual Behavior for the Human Male, recounts experiments of nine pedophiles he employed for his research. He includes the chart that includes that these trained pedophiles were inducing orgasms in babies as young as five years of age. It's sick. It's like the stuff that I was studying and preparing, I almost threw up. I'm like, how can somebody take this as a research to be used to change people's minds, but it was. How were the children and infants judged by having these experiences that he claims that they can have? Kinsey looked for several behaviors, violent convulsions, groaning, so sobbing, violent cries and abundance of tears. Extreme trembling and fainting, excruciating pain and screaming. What normal parent will look at that as a sign of trauma, abuse, he said it's a sign that the child is experiencing pleasure. Sick, demonic, barbaric. That, my friend, became an apostle of sexual revelation that I believe some degree affected the sexual revolution that today is still gaining steam in our culture. That's why we have to stand by biblical values because the culture won't. The biblical design for sexuality as the Bible teaches us is different. But I want to just for a moment speak to those of you who are maybe Christian and the idea that we're talking about this makes you a little bit uncomfortable. People who maybe feel like this is one of the reasons I don't want to be a Christian is because Christians are intolerant, bigoted, bunch of haters, and they're not tolerative and I don't want to be a part of a community that seems to hate everybody. First of all, we unconditionally, like our God, love people. Because we were once sinners too and it was Christ that redeemed us. We were not born righteous, we were born sinners and many of us have done things, you see our testimonies, we don't hide away the stuff God delivered us from. We're not ashamed of the power of the gospel. We're ashamed of sin. We're not ashamed of sharing our story and letting you know, listen, that's who I was, but that's not who I am. Here at Hungry Gen, we don't just show all of the people who have a perfect life. We show, listen, this is how perfected we can be through Jesus. Come on, somebody. In a second, thanks for give the Lord a round of applause. Yes, it's strong language. Yes, hearing from a drag queen on Sunday morning might slightly be like, man, did I, was that, was that the right service I brought my kids to and everything? Well, they bring those people to read stories to the children. It would be good to hear of somebody who got delivered from a drag queen to a child of God, a pastor and delivered by Jesus. Come on, somebody. So let me make something else very clear. Disagreeing with somebody is not a form of hate. And so for all of those who feel like, oh, it's hateful if you disagree. Well, why is it that community when they disagree with us, it's not hateful for them? Yes, Christians are intolerant. We do believe Jesus is the way, not a way. 
We are intolerant in that sense. We believe there's only one way to the Father and that is Jesus. If there is somebody who will come, whose birth will be supernatural, walk on water, calm the storms, die at 33 and rise again and says He is the way, I'll be lean to consider it. But there has been nobody else. Buddha's tomb is still there. Muhammad's tomb is still there. Jesus' tomb is empty. So what He says, I'm willing to bank my life on that. Not on Kinsey's reports, on God's report. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. Amen. With that said, do not trade your birthright for a cultural bowl of soup. Culture will offer you temporary acceptance and say, if you believe our propaganda, you will be accepted. You will fit in. You will be a part of this. It's cool now. It's trendy to come out. So many people are becoming engaged just because it's cool and it gives them, they're not good at a lot of other things. And so it lets them stand out, be some kind of a champion of some kind of a cause. And young people want to be a part of the cause. So they feel like a marginalized, suppressed, oppressed community by the religious bigots and all of those things. So it gives them a sense of identity. But please understand, if you deconstruct from Christianity to fit in into your culture, you will stand before God and give an account. What will you say then? This young man tell, told us, he prophesied, did all these things, had a relationship with God, but had no re reverence for God. You can know God loves you and have absolutely no fear of God. Because fear of God causes us to run from sin, not celebrate it. Fear of God causes us to call sin of what it is, not a weakness, not an alternative lifestyle, but it's abomination. And we have too many people today, what they did is they sanitized the Bible to the way that it conforms to their lifestyle instead of bringing the Bible for what it is, for, it, for, the, for the Bible to transform their lifestyle. One of the reasons that Hungry Gen, we don't conform and we don't affirm gave lifestyle, we've seen too many people delivered from that. We see the Bible and Jesus gives us power to be set free from that. And our God does not change because our culture evolves. Our God is loving but He's not tolerant of sin. He judged sin on the cross. He's a holy God. Amen. So I want to invite you into that. What is God's design of sex? He designed it. Not Playboy magazine. Not the culture. God designed sex to be between a husband and the wife. The first time we see a man saw a woman naked, it was a husband and a wife. If you're seeing somebody naked and it's not your spouse, it's a sin. So the only person you should be seeing naked is your spouse. God designed it between husband and the wife. For what purpose was sex designed? Now traditional teaching will tell you that the only reason why God designed sex is so that you can have children. I've heard of one person boasting his, you know, I think they had about 16 children. He says, I've never seen my wife naked. How did they make those children? He said, none of your business. <laughs> sex wasn't just designed so that you have children, even though it was for procreation, for pleasure, also for protection. Protection from what? The Bible says in Corinthians, a man instead of burning with lust should get married. Now at first it seems like, oh wow, the Bible tells a man to run away from lust into marriage. And everybody who's been married knows that marriage can fix your lust problem. But Paul is saying that marriage, marital bed and healthy intimacy in marriage does provide a sense of protection for a man and a woman. Come on somebody. More protection Lord. Pleasure. Intimacy, knowing. Sex is knowing another person. The Bible says that Adam knew his wife. Sex is also for comfort. Adam, the, uh, the Bible says David, he slept with Bathsheba and he comforted her. And so those are the purposes why God gives us physical relationship within marriage. Another thing that we want to highlight and that is this, is that sex is a super glue in relationships. In Corinthians it says, if a man joins, has a physical relationship with a prostitute, they will become one. 
That's where we get this idea that people can have soul bonds or some call it soul ties through sexual intimacy with somebody. That's why the Bible says man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they will become one. That word one means that there is that super glue. So those of you single people who are like, you know, I, I, this person that I'm interested in is like a car on the lot. I need to test drive it before I know if it's good. And so I need to, you know, take them to bed and I want to see how good they are sexually before I can commit to them. Well, the problem is the person is not a car you test drive. A sex in relationship is not a car you go for a test drive with. It's more like a super glue. Now, how many of you went to Walmart and bought super glue? You're like, let me open it and try it on my fingers to see if it works. Nobody does that. You trust that it works. And if it doesn't, you'll return it. But I can guarantee you every super glue will work. And you don't put it on your finger to test it. You always put it where you intend it to permanently cement and glue something. You don't want to practice sex. That belongs on your wedding night. Why? Because it will permanently cement something. If you don't believe me, why after the breakups that had sex involved is the hardest to heal from, to overcome and get over. Why? Something in you went into something in them. Something in them went into something in you. If you don't believe it, how many deliverances we do where demons enter through sex? There is a transfer that happens not only of the soul but even of the spirit of a person during that. It's a super glue and you don't want to glue yourself with somebody you don't want to be permanently with. The Bible also tells us that sex is for service, meaning we serve each other through sex. I love that illustration in the Bible. Because as a husband and as a wife, you must understand sex is not a chore. It's part of your serving to, to, to your spouse. Their body belongs to you, your body belongs to them. Now I do want to mention something. Because this verse in Corinthians many times is used typically by men to demand or force sex. Paul used this verse to encourage men and women to give each other in satisfying their spouse. Not as a right to demand it or force it from their spouse. Christianity is not about force or demanding. It's about willingly serving to your spouse. All forced sex, even within marriage, without consent is rape. Even if it's your spouse. It doesn't belong in marriage, it's not biblical and the person like that should be reported to police and go to jail. You cannot use the scripture to defend forcing or making somebody have sex with you even if they are your spouse. Each person the Bible calls it, we're called to serve each other, not force each other to meet our needs. Amen. Amen. The Bible also teaches that sexual desires are to be controlled they are not your boss and they shouldn't be driving you. In Colossians, in Thessalonians, I apologize, Paul says, let each man learn to rule his vessel. See, animals are ruled by their sexuality because they have bodies and no spirit. Angels are spirits but no body. So they deny. They don't have sexuality. The Bible says the ones in heaven don't have any. The demons of course they have different stuff. But angels, they are spirits, no bodies. They can take on the body but they just don't have a physical uh, body that as like us. So they don't have that sexuality, sexual needs. Animals have bodies but they don't have spirits. So therefore animals drive, urges drive them. This is what happens in our culture. We have students, they get trained from the little age all the way until they finish their master's degrees. You are an animal, you came from a family of animals millions, millions, millions of years ago. When you teach a generation that they are nothing but beasts, it's difficult for them to control urges when you were conditioned to live like an animal. But I want to tell you, you are not a beast. You're made in the image and likeness of God. You can control your urges. You can control your sexual desires. Now sometimes they may be harder than your willpower but that's why we have the Holy Ghost power that comes to help us to live a crucified life instead of carnal life. Amen. 
So for those who walk around like, you know what, my body wants it. I just feel this urge. I can't control it. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He gives us that control. We can live. It doesn't mean that we deny it. We live like angels. And see, when I was younger, I wanted to be an angel. So the desire for opposite sex is not the sin. It's when you have illegitimate, forbidden desires that go outside of God's parameters. Those are sin. When I was younger, I would come up and say, Lord, make me, take away my desires for a woman. I don't want to desire a man, a woman. I want to desire nothing but you. And I said, Lord, kill it. And of course, I thank God he didn't answer all of that prayer. <laughs> because I would quickly start growing wings and be in heaven. See, God doesn't want to kill it. He wants to give you power to guard it. Control it possess it. Why? Because you are not an angel. At least not yet. Some is like, man, I am an angel. This happened to be the bad one. The demon. No, my friend, you're not an angel. But you need to not allow the culture to condition you to live like an animal. Where, oh, it's ruling my life. No, my friend, you can be a human being. Not an animal, not an angel, but an image barrier who has a body, who has a soul, but is a spirit. Therefore, I have desires, but through the power of the spirit, I can control those desires. Come on, somebody. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Those of you in the first and second sanctuary. Somebody shout, I'm a human. Somebody shout, I'm not an animal. Somebody shout, I'm not an angel. Amen. Now, anything that God designs, Satan seeks to create deviation, distraction, distortion of it. Hannah plays cello. Hannah on our team here, she plays a beautiful instrument, cello. And cello has really two big parts. One of them is the bow and the other one is the cello. Now, I'm not a musician. Now imagine first time that you would see an instrument that's composed of two parts. How that instrument works is that cello cannot produce music without the bow. The bow cannot produce music without the cello. The bow needs the cello, the cello needs the bow, and when they come together, they make music. God created a male and a female in such a way that when they come together, they make a baby. And there is a design that's attached to the way you were formed in your body as a cisgender, heterosexual male, heterosexual female. The way you were formed by God, when we come together, we make something beautiful. Now, it does not mean that a male cannot be fulfilled without a female. Our identity is in Jesus. But we also have a role on this earth to multiply, to fill heaven and earth with God's image barriers. What Satan likes to do is he likes to take sexuality from the realm of God's designed place and place it into the realm that it doesn't belong to. Think with me. For those of you who do gardening, and I don't do gardening, my parents do, and other people do gardening, but maybe you do gardening. In gardening, you have to have soil for the flower bed or for anything that has to do with, with plants soil, nurturous soil, good soil. As you put that soil there, it nurtures the flowers. Take exactly the same soil that nurtures, nurtures, nurtures flowers, add it to your salad during the dinner. It will no longer be nurturing, it will become dirty, nasty, and it will become something that's not healthy. Actually, it becomes dirt. Why? Because in the flower bed, it's a soil. On your dinner plate, it's dirt. Sex is powerful, but it's nurturing. In the flower bed, as God designed between a husband and the wife, it causes nurture, bonding, comfort, protection, pleasure, procreation. When you take it outside and you put it into a dinner plate or you take it into a same-sex relationship. 
me and my boyfriend or me and my girlfriend instead of a heterosexual cisgender between husband and the wife relationship what you begin to experience is guilt shame what you begin to experience is sexually transmitted diseases what you begin to experience is things just don't flow together they're not it's not working together. Did you see that um, guy that was riding a shopping cart in, San, in um, San Antonio? You didn't see that? Now a shopping cart is to put groceries in. He decided to take it and put himself in it and drive it. Now you may see that as creative and you may say, well, that's exactly what we do with sexuality. We just take it outside of the social construct and we add it to something else. But the Bible calls it abomination because it's different. Unlike the shopping cart, our bodies, our emotions were created by a creator and they have a particular designations that flow with that design. Everything we buy, we have warning labels on them today. You know, don't use it like this. Take this pill, for example, if you take melatonin, it's supposed to help you sleep and you treat it like Advil and you take pills of melatonin and get behind the steering wheel, you're going to fall asleep. If you treat the clicker of a gun like a clicker of the pen, somebody will die. There are certain things that are designed for particular ways and if we stay within those designs and those designations, the world is safe, there is love and harmony. When they are taking out of those designations, we begin to bring harm and we begin to not only offend our Creator, but we begin to hurt ourselves as well. And the Bible makes it very clear that sexuality outside of God's design is incest, adultery, fornication, bestiality, homosexuality, prostitution and rape. Just because sex is powerful and beautiful, it doesn't mean you can do it with anyone, anything, when and how. It's like a gun. You get it? It's powerful. My wife has a gun. It's a beautiful Kimberly company, I think that's what it's called. I got a different one though. We bought a safe yesterday. One of the reasons is because though a gun is powerful, you can just walk it around like you're a thug. I can't walk in on the street with my gun like with an iPhone just for protection even the concealed carry you, you have to hide it you can't I can't walk around and wave it like a Bible and I could say but, but I bought it it's mine I can do whatever I want with it well there are cer certain social norms that because it's so powerful it has to stay hidden there are certain legislations certain safeguards for it and if I would be walking in the mall and just waving it like this they say, well, it's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. And that's where our culture says, it's mine. Well, the thing about it, it's not just about you. You belong to God. He created you. He has certain safeguards. And secondly, it's not just about you. It's about your children. It's about your grandchildren. It's how your lifestyle affects people that you bring into this world. And we have to build a holy, wholesome environment in our generation. Somebody say, Amen. But the real issue and the real problem guys that we have in our culture is what Paul had in his and let's go to Romans chapter 1. Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 1 and he says the following and I'll read just randomly verses verse 22. Professing to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Verse 27. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of a woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. 2,000 years ago the culture Christians lived in was not much different than our culture. Romans inherited a lot of their ideas from Greeks. Greeks 
were not necessarily sexually pure. They had gods and they also had cult prostitutes. Romans took it to another level. Their god Zeus at one time transformed himself into an eagle to steal this young man whom he made into his husband or his partner. He was a practicing homosexual god. So it's no wonder when Paul was writing this, Nero the emperor took one young man, castrated him and made him into his wife. Sometime later, Nero married another man and Nero made himself a wife and his husband became a husband. The culture was so perverted. It was pedophilia, was very normal. Older men regularly had physical relationship with teenage boys. Temples were filled with prostitution, male and female prostitutes. Please understand what you see today on the streets of America. America is becoming more like Rome every single day. From our governments, big tech, as well as everywhere, perversion is becoming normal. Paul did not endorse it. He wrote stuff against it. In here he gives us three problems. Number one, he says this, everything started with one thing. Men exchange the image of God for their own image. Now for those days in Rome, they had gods that they built with their hands and they worshiped them. At first it may seem like, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the demon, demons would come and take the place of those idols and now demons actually control those people. Christians differ from Roman pagan culture is because Christians didn't worship gods that they made. Christians worshiped God that made them. And that God had a face and the face of that God was Jesus Christ. You want to know the photo of God? Look at Jesus. He is the image of invisible God. The second thing different between Christians and Romans and pagan Romans is that Christians differed with their sex ethic. Sexual ethic was different than the ones of Romans. Christians believed in marriage between a man and a woman. They believed in sex between a husband and wife. They didn't believe in rape. They didn't believe in incest, in polygamy, in so many other things. And so Christians were different. And Paul begins to draw that line. And then he tells us in Romans that when we exchange the image of invisible God into an image of idol, after that we suppress the truth and we exchange the truth for a lie. And then what God does, God steps back and gives us up to our passions, debased mind and all other perversions. Our culture did exactly the same. Now we don't have Buddhas that we worship in our houses. We don't have things wooden. What we have is we have an image of God in our mind that we created. A God that's tolerant. A God that changed with times. A God that's not oppressive and tells us what to do. A God that doesn't change because we created Him. It's an image of a God who doesn't exist. But He exists in our mind. And this image is actually what demons attach themselves to. When we make this God, after that we change the truth. We suppress it first after suppressing and suppressing and suppressing. Kinsey's report, others reports came and now we change the truth into a lie. And God steps back and He gives us up. Guess to what? Our own passions for us to self-destruct. Today our truth is what matters instead of God's truth. But to follow your own truth is like following a wheelbarrow. You're the one guiding it. Yeah. I know what the truth is. You're changing it every generation. When sailors are in the storm, they're not led by a candle in the ship. They're led by external fixed points that guide them called the sun, the stars and the shore. Our culture has replaced outside external points that guide, used to guide us into we light a candle called inclus being inclusive tolerant, affirming to everything and we say this is our guide of truth and we keep tweaking it every generation and we get confused, lost and become pagan, occultic now because we know we're not at peace with the real God. We're only with the peace with the God we made in our own mind and our own hearts.
Amen. If your theology has not affected your sexuality, you haven't truly been sanctified. Your belief has to affect your bedroom. That's what it did for Christians. Zeus was the God of Romans. That's why they live perverted life. Christ is the God of Christians. That's why we live a different life. For those of you who are like, Vlad, just talk, talk to me about Jesus. Don't tell me anything else. What I do, who I do with and everything. But you must understand the second thing that separates Christians from pagans is their sexual ethic. You cannot separate your theology from your biology. You cannot separate your belief from your bedroom. You cannot separate and say, I just believe in God, but don't tell me what and who I should sleep with and everything. Because our God is not just a spare tire in our trunk. He's not just somebody I believe in. Just in case there is hell, I don't want to be there. He is the Lord of our life. He's the said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He didn't say, I'm just one of many gods. He says, I am the truth. He says he is the Son of God and he proved by rising from the dead. And therefore, I'm going to bank my life on Jesus. I'm going to trust in Jesus. I don't know about you. You can trust the culture. Maybe you want to trust your generation. I'm going to trust somebody who made generations. His name is Jesus Christ. His word will not pass. The Bible says the flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord endures forever. He says that this generation will pass, but not one comma and a dot will pass before they will not come true. His Word is eternal. Somebody give God some praise right now. In the second century, somebody give God some praise right now. The last thing that I want to highlight and that is deliverance. Beckett Cook was born in Texas, but then he moved to LA moved to LA because it suited his gifts and his creative side as well as his homosexual orientation. At the young age he was sexually abused by one of his father's friends and he started to live as an open gay person, came to California, worked for ads for Nike, Louis Vuitton, as well as helped work with very famous photographers for different very successful companies. One of the things that he constantly felt is sense of emptiness. Every boyfriend he had, male boyfriend, cheated on him. There was a sense of brokenness that was there. At one time he was at this party in Paris and this emptiness became so real. He started to question, why do I exist? Is there more to life than this? He entertained the thought of God, but he knew clearly what God thought of him. Because God didn't endorse that lifestyle, so he put that God thought to rest. At the same time as he was living openly gay lifestyle, Beckett had a mother. She was a devout Christian. She never shamed or called him with names. She loved him, but she knew and she made sure he knew what God believed about his lifestyle. And she prayed for him. Interestingly, he actually recently shared his prayer point, her prayer points. And I'm gonna uh, highlight them. It was a very powerful warfare prayer. Prayer that went like this. Lord, deal aggressively with the enemy. Lord, come against him in all powerful name of Jesus. With the sword of the Spirit, with the Word of God. She would say, Lord, I ask you that you will command these things to be removed from my son Beckett. Spirit of homosexuality. Desire for homosexuality. Denial of his heterosexuality. Remove all the blocks of truth. We bind you Satan in the name of Jesus. Beckett belongs to Christ. She prayed and prayed and prayed and she died. She didn't see his son, her son come to know Jesus. Two years later in a coffee shop in LA, he sees people reading the scripture in the coffee shop. So he comes up to them and he says, are you guys Christians? They're like, yes we are. And his second question to them was, what do you believe about homosexuality? They said, we believe the Bible says it's sin. And he says, if this would have happened five years before that, I would tell him, your God is outdated, repressive. Your guy's stuck in 1950s. What's wrong with you? But he says, because of what happened six months or five months before that in Paris, that sense of emptiness, he says, I was willing to listen to them as they told me the gospel right there. Almost 
like they were attacking me but they were not attacking me so like before that I would have felt like their belief attacked me but this time I knew that my own lifestyle was judging me he said I went to church see the mom's prayers were still working openly gay living in a Hollywood lifestyle comes to church pastor preaches a sermon on the cross he says the conviction of God hits me I come and give my life to Christ Beckett renounces his old life, commits to follow Jesus as a disciple. In fact, writes a book that starts to help a lot of people become Christians and come from that community and that lifestyle. And he says, I didn't embrace identity as a homosexual. I embraced identity as a cisgender, heterosexual man as God created me to be. And today he lives for Jesus. If you are in this room today, I want to appeal to you. If you believe that, you know, I can love God and still be a gay Christian. What is wrong with that? Well, there's a few things you need to consider. Not only homosexuality was not God's design for sexual expression, but God clearly called it abomination. Practicing homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. You can't be gay Christian anymore that you can be a lying Christian. Homosexual is someone who identifies as homosexual and engages in sexual activity with the members of same-sex gender. Homosexual is, finds his identity in his sin. A Christian is somebody who finds his identity in his Savior. We are new creation. We don't drag our old life into this new life. The Bible says if you take an old piece of cloth, attach it to the new one, you ruin the whole cloth. Meaning Jesus doesn't want you to drag parts of you that you can't change into your relationship with Christ. He wants to be the Lord of everything about you, not 98% of you. Can somebody say amen? Being tempted with homosexuality is not the same thing as identifying as homosexual. Every Christian can be tempted with all kinds of bizarre, sinful and wicked things. But we can find assurance that being tempted with something doesn't mean you are sinning it. Our Christ Savior was tempted to worship the devil in the wilderness. It didn't make him sinful. Being tempted with something that's sinful doesn't make you sinful. But when you take on the sinful nature, sinful inclination and desires and say, this is the way God made me. This is the way that I was born. This is the way that I am. And now Christ has to change himself to accommodate me. My friend, what you just did is you exchanged the truth of God for a lie. You exchanged it for the lie. All of us were born in sin. Maybe you claim that you were born gay. All of us were born with some kind of a gene within our sinful nature that needs to be redeemed, killed first, and then Christ gives us a new nature. For those of you who are here and maybe you find yourself in alphabet community, you're living and you're proud because it's accepting you and you're enjoying the pleasure of fitting in. I want to tell you that Christianity is rebellious. Christianity is the opposite of culture. To go up you have to go down, to live you have to die. It's not going to be like, if you think that I can just come to Christian faith and be popular, you don't become Christian to be popular, you become Christian to be saved. Amen. In the genealogy of Jesus, the Bible mentions four women. Interestingly, all those four, three of them lived sexually immoral life. Tamar slept with her father-in-law. Bathsheba committed adultery. Rahab was a temple cult prostitute. We see Ruth was a Moabite. They practiced taking children through the fire and practiced sexual immorality. And Christ came through all these women. You know one thing about these women? God changed them. When they were transformed by being connected to the lineage of Jesus. If you think that Christians are just people who are walking around, they just, they just hate on this thing. Christians are all used to be sinners who were redeemed by Jesus. We all had traumas, we all had dramas, we all had demons, curses, but when we came to Jesus, He set us free. He delivered us because our Savior loves us and our Savior has grace and He has help and He has hope. 
the final verse that I'm going to read and we're going to give a call to salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now it's interesting when you read that list you're like, yeah that's right. Of course not the fornicators, not those who worship idols, definitely not the ones who cheat on their husbands or wives. Definitely not the thieves. I know somebody who stole something from me. They're not going to heaven. Not the covetous. Drunkards. No, I know somebody who was drunk and killed somebody on the highway. Bad people. Extortioners. Like they, they extort all the people, especially now through their social security and all of this stuff. Bad people. But the homosexuals and the sodomites, nah, I don't think about that. But the Bible puts them all in one category. Because they're all sinners. In God's mind, it's sin. But I love that it doesn't end there. It says this and such were some of you. So it's not just saying look at these bad people. It says look at your past. Such were some of you. But guess what happened? God didn't become tolerant. We became transformed. It says this, but you were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Repent of your sin. Place your trust in Jesus. If you're coming today, our goal as Christians is not to make you straight. Our goal is to bring you to Jesus. Now it is true, if you're living a homosexual life, you are against God's design. But if you choose to rebel against God, make up your own God and go to hell, honestly, it's your decision. You can do as you will. You're your own God. You make rules as you go. I remember a young person met me in the lobby one time and he asked me a question. He says, Pastor, is it sin to smoke weed? I said, for you, it's bad. He says, but I can still do it, right? I said, absolutely. He looked at me with these eyes. He said, you're telling me I can smoke weed? Now I knew his parents. I knew they were praying for him and this boy was as lost as anybody can be. And I liked him. I said, you know you're going to hell. You know that. Your mama knows that. Half of your school knows that because he got kicked out of school for dubious behavior. I said, you know that, right? I was like, what difference will it make if you go to, to hell as a pothead or if you go to hell without smoking pot? I said, if I would be you and I would go to hell, I would smoke all that I can so at least when I'm there I know why I'm there. Now this again, just this is not a conversation you should have with everybody but this is just, I'm just telling you what the youth pastor said to young men. He looked at me, his pupils were like Phew. He said, you kidding me right? I said, no, I'm just with honest truth. I said, you don't want to follow Jesus. You practicing sin, just I'm like, live it up. You're going there. You'll probably get there faster though. At least when you're there, you'll know why you are there. That night he gave his life to Christ. <laughs> Praise God. If you become straight, this doesn't add to your salvation. We are saved by the grace of Jesus not by our cisgender heterosexual lifestyle. We are saved by Jesus and we first come to Jesus the way we are. Some are like, man, I'm going to break up with my boyfriend first or my girlfriend if you're in a lesbian relationship and then I'm going to come to Jesus. You don't take a shower before you take a shower. You go straight the way you are. Jesus expects you the way you are. Broken, bruised up, maybe confused and He wants to wash you with His blood. He wants to wash your shame, wants to wash your guilt. He wants to wash you. The Bible says He wants to sanctify you. That means He wants to set you apart for Himself. It's not about Jesus taking you away from something as much as taking you into something. His love, His righteousness, His peace and His Holy Spirit. He wants to justify you, meaning He wants to make you as just as you've never seen before. A few things that I want to give to those people that are struggling with homosexuality. If you became a Christian, submit your sexuality to God. James 4-7 tells us, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
you can't come against spirit of homosexuality until you submit your biology to Jesus submit all of your life to God submit your mind and your thoughts and your body your feelings your trauma your hurt the abuse everything say Jesus I'm surrendering my whole life to you and then you rise up from the submission to God and you say devil get behind me that tendency those thoughts those voices I rebuke you in Jesus name the second thing that we must do is we must flee lust. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22, it says that flee youthful lust. That means flee relationships that trigger homosexual tendencies, desires, or not maybe homosexual things, but pornography, lust, immorality. Flee those things. Part of discipleship is being engaged in your sexual purity by running away from things that are demonic. If you have apps where you maybe constantly find people, delete those apps. If those apps lead you away from Christ. If you find yourself scrolling through things that cause you to fall into sexual immorality, flee from that stuff. If you're walking in the mall, and Victoria who has no secrets keeps looking at you turn your head around keep on walking straight and do not need to do spiritual warfare that God will clothe her with garments of righteousness just keep on walking flee youthful lust some people say well I just need to fight it yes there's a time to fight but there's a time to flee when a porn image showed up on your computer you don't go I rebuke that I rebuke no shut the computer down the power it down, plug it from the cord and go to a different room. Run from that stuff. Joseph didn't try to convert Potiphar's wife. He fled from her. Some of you may be engaged in the immoral relationships. You're like, no, but I'm going to save them. Flirt to convert. You know, I'm just going to really get them saved first. Save your soul first. Get out. Run from that. Oh, but they will think I'm some kind of a, a hater. Listen, it's more important that you save your soul. And you save the relationship first. Let God save that person. Take your thoughts captive. As those thoughts come in and say, you're homosexual. You're a lesbian. That's who you are. You're a porn addict. You're a pervert. All of these. You take those, those thoughts are not to be trusted. Christians are taught to train their thoughts, not to trust them. Not everything that comes into your head is from God. Not everything should be embraced and accepted. We do warfare with our thoughts. We don't come in as slaves and say, oh yeah, that thought came in that I'm ugly, worthless, no good. I should take a gun and blow my brains. I guess what I'm going to do is follow my thoughts. We follow God. We don't believe in Oprah religion where you follow your heart. We believe in the religion of the Bible that the heart is wicked. Meaning your thoughts can be trusted. Submit them. Literally make them prisoners of you. Take them captive. Don't live in the captive of your mind. Don't make your mind your master. You make, make your mind your servant. Amen. Forgive those that hurt you. A lot of people who are in homosexual, even transgender, community have been hurt, sometimes seduced, experienced breakdown of a family, having either domineering father or mother, abused, trauma and come to Jesus and let him know that what happened to you. Talk to somebody, seek a counselor, maybe a therapist so that that trauma can be addressed. When you get hurt, you got to address the wound. You know that if somebody gets shot, if the wound is not addressed, it becomes an infection and then it spreads and the person can die, not from the shot, but from the fact that that wound was never addressed. Don't think that time will heal. Time doesn't heal. Jesus does. It takes time to heal, but time is not the great healer. God is the great healer. Seek deliverance, lastly. Maybe you're seeing that you repented, you experienced God's love, you believe the truth. You're not who the world says you are. You're not who other people said you are. You are who God says you are. But you keep having these lingering thoughts, lingering urges and desires. Come for prayer today. Come for prayer to our church. Go to your small group. Ask for prayer because there is he healing. There is hope. There is freedom and there is deliverance. This is not a hate message. This is a freedom message. Deliverance message. There is hope and there is healing. I've seen homosexuals set free but I also have seen depression in their eyes when some knew that it was wrong tried their best and they said I couldn't get free so then they came to that realization 
because I can't overcome it, I will let it overcome me. It's just the way I am. And because the culture affirms it, they said, I give up and I quit. Yes, in yourself, you can't overcome it. But when you come to Jesus, there is hope, there is healing, there is freedom, and there is deliverance. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were delivered. If you're addicted to pornography, there is hope for you. That is healing for you. If you're addicted to some other ways that you are expressing yourself that are demonic and are not godly, I'm, I know you're feeling shame, you're feeling guilt. The Holy Spirit's conviction brings hope, brings light, and brings deliverance. The Holy Spirit doesn't conform and doesn't say, oh yeah, just stay in that sin because you're still loved. He says, no, let me bring you to the light where you can experience freedom so you don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in your guilt, but live in God's light, God's freedom. And God's delivered. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.